Hi, and welcome to another episode of the First Year Experience Podcast. My name is Dr. Jose Saldivar, and as always, joining me are my gracious co-hosts, Mr. Nick Valderas, uh, Gerson Salinas, and we have a new guru joining us today, uh, Ms. Lavette Sanez. I'm going to go ahead and allow Lavette to give us a little bit about herself, uh, tell us about what she's majoring in, and her hopes for the upcoming academic year. Lavette? Uh, hi there, my name is Lavette May Sanez. I am a mass communication major. I'm also minoring in graphic design. I'm one of the social media gurus this year, and one of my biggest hopes for this academic year is to pass all of my classes and succeed and go on to the next semester. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lavette, for joining us. And uh, so, as Lavette mentioned, she's, she works with our social media group. So if you follow any of our accounts, uh, as I hope you do, um, you'll notice a lot of the work that's, that's being produced by our gurus. It's amazing work. And so if I haven't said that already, to my gurus here, the ones that are joining me, thank you all. I think you all are doing outstanding work. And I look forward to, to the future work that you all are going to be producing for us. I know it's going to be outstanding. Um, joining us today is... Uh, a professor, professor of political science, um, and he is going to be with us to talk about the census. Uh, I know, I know it doesn't sound exciting, but I guarantee you he will make it exciting. That's why we're having him on today. So no pressure. Yeah, no pressure a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to allow him to introduce himself, give him a little, give us a little bit of background uh, about himself and, and, uh, and maybe Actually, maybe why he thinks I've invited him on to talk about the census. So, Bob, take it away. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Robert Velez. I'm a member of the faculty in the political science department here at UTRGV. Starting my third year here, uh, I got here back in 2018. Uh, previous to uh, UTRGV, I was still in Texas up at Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches in East Texas. Uh, and then before then, I was at uh, Winona State University in Minnesota for a year. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from New York City originally, but don't hold that against me. Uh, you know, I know I'm an outsider here in, in Texas. Uh, I accept that role. Uh, I, I'm willing to endure the ridicule and the mocking for being a Yankee. I get it. It's, it's cool. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I, I, as uh, uh, Dr. Saldivar said, I, uh, I'm a faculty member. I teach generally the, which is the introductory course that everyone who wants to get a degree has to take it. So you may end up seeing me at some point. Uh, I, I have lots of colleagues that teach it as well, but that's that's a that's majority of the classes I teach. Uh, I also teach and have taught uh, media and politics, one of my areas of. Uh, specialty, one of my areas of expertise. I, I have taught the interest groups and political movements uh, class, which I will be teaching in the spring, uh, if you don't mind me plugging my class uh, briefly here. Uh, so uh, majors or not, you, you, it's, it's certainly available uh, for people. That I, I, I discovered politics through, uh, not necessarily starting through the academic route, uh, I, I did it as a journeyman volunteer, uh, getting involved in uh, retail, shoe leather politics, you know, doing outreach to voters. Um, I actually ran for office myself back in uh, 2002 up in Minnesota. So I have uh, lots of interest in politics. I know not everybody thinks it's as interesting as I do, but that's cool. You don't have to. Um, let the it's job security for me if you uh, <laughs> if you don't think it's it's all that interesting. Uh, why did you invite me on? Uh, well, uh, we've had some interactions in the past, and I think I'm just that charming that you, <laughs> you couldn't resist. Exactly. <laughs> you know, having having to have a a conversation about something that seemingly might seem to the uninitiated to be a really boring and unexciting uh, thing like counting people. Uh, which, it, quite frankly, it does sound kind of boring, doesn't it? Um, uh, counting people. This is something that our country does every 10 years. Uh, but it has, it, it is very important. And while it may seem kind of, I mean, look, any professor that does research will tell you that coding data, entering data into a spreadsheet or putting it into, you know, a, a statistical analysis 
software suite can be very tedious. Usually we have grad students do it. So Nick, I need to speak to you after this event <laughs> because I have some data that, I, <laughs> that I might want you to enter. I'm teasing, of course. Uh, but uh, it is important. Um, yeah. We, and it's important for every taxpayer. And I want to clarify what that, what I mean by that. Um, the census doesn't only count citizens. A lot of people have a, a, a misunderstanding of that, right? That, oh, well, they're counting citizens to know, you know, because one of the things that the census data does is it provides us a foundation and a basis for drawing congressional districts for the House of Representatives. Uh, and for the state legislature in Austin. Uh, that's one of the things the census data uh, is used for. Uh, the last two rounds of census uh, in Texas, when they redrew districts, uh, Texas found themselves in court, both, both le the last two cycles, uh, because of how the districts were drawn. Um, so uh, will that happen again? Uh, I don't know if the past is any predictor of the future, potentially. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that works out. But uh, in addition to uh, counting citizens for purposes of representation in our elected bodies, yeah. it's also used to allocate public dollars, tax dollars, uh, which if you buy things, and I'm sure most people students, faculty, staff, they tend to buy things oh, yeah. from, from time to time. Yeah. Uh, more so are, now. More no, so now that we're, <laughs> that we're in, a, in a pandemic and cooped up at home, right? <laughs> That's our favorite pastime. <laughs> I mean, you've, you've heard about the toilet paper, right? I mean, that, that was the big thing. Everyone's buying toilet paper. Um, uh, I, for, for a time, whenever I went to the HEB, I couldn't find my pickles. I, you know, I have a thing for pickles, okay? Uh, and they didn't have, they had plenty of other kinds of pickles, but not the ones that I wanted. <laughs> All right. And this is, you know, this is, can be a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> but so, kidding aside. Uh, if you buy things, you're a taxpayer. And I tell mm -hmm. students all the time, uh, whether you're a citizen or not, you have every right as a taxpayer to make demands of the of the government um, and one of the things that the government has to do is forecast what the needs will be in various communities for public goods things like public hospitals and and roads and and so, some federal money goes to local law enforcement and some federal money goes to local education uh, independent school districts uh, not you know it's largely local but uh, there is some federal, there are federal resources that go into every community. And that's why it's so important to make sure we get as accurate account as possible uh, of the people that are living here, not just citizens, mm -hmm. because uh, it's not just citizens that use public goods, things like public parks and police and fire and, yeah. and, and schools. So, uh, so it is important to get a, to get a solid count, which is why there's, they do it through multiple means, right? They do yeah. it. You can, they send you things in the mail, uh, to, to a survey to fill out. If, if they don't get that back from you, they may send someone out to your door, uh, to interview you and take that data, uh, in person. So, uh, lots of ways and there lots of, uh, lots of counting going on has been going on for several months. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, all correct. I mean, well, obviously, you you know, I think more about the census than I do. But yeah, your uh, assumptions about why I invited you on were spot on. Because um, I well, no, I mean, look, no, knowing and and right, we have had some interactions in the past. We've had some good conversations. I think about politics and and I, I think more so. Um, I I think and and I think that was evident if uh, that it just came across right. Your your interest and your passion for it, and so. I thought if anybody can make this interesting, because I think on the surface, it seems really boring and, and people may not, people may not care. I, I know we always have issues. It seems like we always have issues with people filling it out and, and, and understanding why it's important. And I thought, okay, you know what, I'm going to have, I'm going to have Bob on because I know he's going to care about it. I know it's something that he's also very knowledgeable about. And I think, I think your passion will come through. And I think we've seen that already, right? <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you, Bob. Be because I, 
you know, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with folks from um, the student union and they, they said they were going to have like a census party. And, and we thought, and I know Nick here, Nick, and Nick can, can talk about it too. Uh, Nick's very interested in politics and in leadership and, and talking about sort of community uplift. So we thought, right, the census, what a wonderful opportunity to talk about, right, the community via the census, via representation, via how are we spending our tax dollars and who decides where that money's going? And so we thought, you know what, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's bring it to the podcast. So thank you. Thank you to both of you. Um, to my co-host, do you all have any questions right now? Bob. Well, I was going to mention that I think it does sound a, a bit like people might not care at the beginning, but um, I think when you started talk, saying that it's like your tax money, and where it's going, that's when it's like, oh, okay. Like that interests interest me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, I was gonna say that. I know that it's been going on for a couple months. Uh, I know that I got something in the mail a long time ago, it feels like, where it was asking about how many people are living in the house and stuff like that. Um, so I was gonna ask if it's been going out, I mean, going on for some time already, what does the census day signify? Like, wh why, does the, why is it one day? Well, uh, I mean, not unlike some of the other uh, efforts to promote a particular event, uh, I don't think there's anything critical about the census day per se. Uh, you know, that on this day is when, you know, it's just, this is a day to focus, kind of like we have, you know, uh, Latino History Month and uh, mm -hmm. Black History Month, oh, okay. mm -hmm. to kind of raise awareness, awareness. Uh, that's oh, okay. going on. And, and one thing I will say, though, is that this year, the census uh, actually cut the time that they would use for counting. Uh, they, they reduced it by a month. So I think one of the reasons why there may be an emphasis, uh, you know, this week on mm -hmm. Census Day is because they're, they're not doing it for as long as they have in the past. So why is example, that? I, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, that, look, <clears throat> there may be uh, theories uh, about why that might be. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to get too into too much into the it's the, you know, it's the Illuminati in the back that are saying we need to, you know, not count as many. <laughs> um, but there are some of those conspiracy theories going around. Um, I, I don't think the, the current administration really gave uh, a reason mm -hmm. as to why they were stopping sooner than normal. Uh, depending on who you ask, you might get different reasons. Some people say, well, you know, they... They don't want to count as well because, I mean, I think it would be irresponsible to, uh, you know, project intention yeah. without knowing for sure. Uh, there's plenty of people will give you all kinds of reasons why, um, some more reasonable than others. But it is ending this year on September 30th rather than uh, October 30th, which would be what they've done in the past. So they're, yeah. they, they're investing a little bit less time on the, on the collection part of it. Uh, what kind of impact will that have? Well, here in the Rio Grande Valley, even elected officials, uh, local and, and state and, and federal have said, uh, we generally get undercounted uh, in this area of Texas. Some of that is because we have a very uh, unique geographical area, right? We've got cities like Edinburgh and McAllen and Brownsville that, that are not all that dissimilar from other communities around the country. But we also have the Colonias, right? Mm -hmm. Which some of them don't have uh, uh, the amenities that we come to expect in a first world country, running water, internet access, uh, you know, electricity, uh, you know, thing, things, sewage, uh, yeah. you know, things like that. And um, par I would argue part of the reason that we are underserved in some of those public goods is because of the history of undercounting. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to forecast and project 
uh, what a community needs. And now we're a pretty big metropolitan area. I, this is something I didn't realize when I first got here. We're talking in the four county, uh, what we normally would call the RGV. This is a, you know, more than 1.5 million people live here. And that's probably a conservative estimate. Yeah. So we are a large metropolitan area. Sure, we're spread out geographically. You know, uh, when, when I was living in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, you know, you've got 1.5 million people in a, in a metropolitan area that's, you know, a quarter of the geographical size of the Rio Grande Valley. But, uh, and we've got, you know, large pockets of poverty, uh, uh, which make it challenging. And plus, there are plenty of, uh, of rumors, I guess, or um concerns I, I mean there's lots of people in our area here who have mixed immigration status they're concerned about you know f people from the feds you know to use the <laughs> the term you might hear on you know uh tv shows uh f people from the federal government trying to count people suggesting oh is this going to affect my status are they going to send yeah. the ice after me i mean w one of the things that it is would be important to to express is that by law, and this is right from the census uh, website, the Census Bureau cannot release any, and I'm reading it right off the website, cannot release any identifiable, identifiable information about you, your home, or your business, even to law enforcement agencies. It's protected, that, that privacy of those, the things that they're going to ask you about in mm -hmm. the census is protected by uh, U.S. code, U.S. federal law. So yeah. census workers aren't going to share uh, that private information, particularly with whether it's local or even federal law enforcement. And I think it's important to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm, 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 Oh, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I wanted to follow up with that. It was just uh, in regards to them shortening the length of time that they're going to be counting. Uh, would you say or would you say that that is actually going to affect the redistricting throughout the United States into many different to other to other states. And how do you think that's going to affect those redistricting efforts when we are going to be undercounted in certain areas just because they change the length of the day mm -hmm. or the time they're going to be counting? Well, I, I think it's fair to say it will affect the redistricting redistricting to what extent you know that's uh, all i would be doing is speculating uh mm -hmm. at, at this point to what extent that would be um you know every congressional district has about seven hundred thousand people in it um but <laughs> if you've if you've ever seen a map of the 15th district which utrgv's edinburgh campus is in i mean it goes from the border all the way up to the northeast San Antonio suburbs. So, you know, uh, good. If you want to run for Congress in the 15th district, I hope you got good shoes, because <laughs> and a reliable vehicle. That's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. You know, and these are these are drawn this way for a reason. Um, you know, not to make it more difficult for candidates or elected officials to campaign. But to try and capture uh, enough of this, the 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 unique factors of a congressional district to bring a, a, as much diversity of representation as possible. I know these sound like really lofty kind of, you know, small d democracy kind of ideas. Yeah. Uh, but but really, that's that's essentially what the intention of redrawing these districts is to do, to, yeah. to benefit, to make sure that uh, voices that have historically been underrepresented in institutions like Congress, like the state legislature, uh, in particular, uh, a Latina and Latino voices, Latinx voices. So yeah. um, again, this is another reason why it's important for people to realize that their participation in the census is critical. You know, they, they really want to make sure, I mean, that this is going to decide the next 10 years of, uh, of budget forecasts, of representation, not just at the federal level, but at the state level as well, because they're going to use census data to redraw state Senate districts, state house districts, 
uh, and uh, as well as all those uh, public goods that we have here, things like water and sewer systems and, you know, public roads and uh, um, uh, you know, things like that. So. so so, going back to what you were saying about um, the counts and how it's going to be affecting regional areas like here in the Valley, you know, it's here in the Valley, you could say it's predominantly Hispanic. And, you know, going on like Pew Research, this, they say that by, you know, 2030, Latinos will be the majority. That's like an estimation that they have. And then uh, eligible voters themselves are one in three people are Latino. Mm. And then at the same time, you know, 38 electoral votes and 36 congressional seats have an effect on all our lives. So what do you think about racial equity in the census and how they do not include certain races within you know, the count within like categorizing, you know, a set of people for that count. So that's, that's kind of go follow up into my question. Like, what do you think about um, racial equity in the country for the census? And like, how, how can it help resolve some of those issues? Uh, well, I think by uh, directing public resources, uh, tax dollars to various public goods, be it um, you know, the standard public goods that we think about, uh, police and fire. Uh, but more so, uh, w one of the things that, among, among many other things, that, that this region is underserved in is when it comes to uh, public health, public health care infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, I know we have, uh, you know, hospitals and, and things like that. A lot of those are private. Um, and I think we've been hit harder by the COVID-19 pandemic than other regions in Texas because we are an underserved area. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you could put as many protesters on the street as you want calling for racial equity uh, and, you know, getting people that have previously been underserved getting their fair share. But if the people that we're fighting for and protesting for and advocating for are unwilling to participate in the process, it makes that getting to a more perfect union, right? Which is part of the part of our DNA as a country, you know, we have it right in the preamble. Uh, it makes it hard. It makes it difficult. Yeah. And I, it's understandable the anxiety that comes behind it. You know, I get it. Uh, especially, I don't think it's too partisan to say this particular administration has been hard on immigrants. Uh, and not just here in the Valley and not just people coming from Mexico, but immigration more generally, you know, is has been othered uh, and used as a, you know, they're, I mean, and this is not, this is not unique to this particular administration, but it's, it's kind of been used a little bit. It's almost been weaponized more. Yeah. I think it's fair to say. Um, and so could, can you blame people who might have families with mixed immigration statuses who say, oh, I don't know if I want this federal person asking me these questions. I don't know where this is going. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, and you know, I, I, I feel like this is, uh, I mean, it's important, right? The census is important, but I felt like, um, like this year, you know, we kind of lived it a little more, the undercounting, you felt it a little more, especially with the pandemic. And then, and then you're hit by a hurricane and you see communities that are underwater for extended periods, periods of time. And depending on where you live and the kind of drainage you've got and, and you see the colonias that are especially affected by it negatively, right? And so it felt like, like now it's, it's, it's real. It feels a little real because you see it play out and, and how it's affecting people's lives every day. And so I know for me, I, I, I thought we need to talk about this. We need to get the word out and do whatever we can to encourage people to, to get counted because because it feels it's it's a cycle for us and every time we get hit by a hurricane or we get some some severe rain you know we're underwater for you know some places are underwater for a few days for a week or so 
mm. um, people without electricity for extended periods of time. Um, but definitely, you know, healthcare. Now we're we're really seeing the, that healthcare kind of um, that lack of infrastructure. And so, you know, whatever we can do, I think, to get that message across, and especially for young people and and our students, encourage them to encourage their families and themselves to get counted and and to really um, be a voice, right? And and maybe even help if they are if they do have a family that where maybe a family member to their, their immigration status or their, is, uh, is in question or, you know, they're worried, right. They're afraid and, and rightfully so where they can inform them. Mm. Right? Let's get that information out. Let's empower our students. Let's empower our, um, the student body and, and, and inform them so that then they can go out and inform their parents and their families. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the indirect benefits of education, right? People come, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I mean, uh, oftentimes elected officials and leaders uh, treat higher education as if it's a consumer good, Yeah. right? It's something that you purchase. That's why state funding for public universities like UTRGV over the last 30 years has been dwindling somewhat, right? Let's put more of the cost burden on the person who's getting the service, mm. you know, because it's benefiting them. One of the things I think it's important to mention, right, uh, especially with higher ed and especially in an area like the RGV, is that the indirect benefit to the community of educating people from this area who then can go out and inform and educate and enlighten uh, has a benefit that goes far beyond the individual who gets the, the paper that they put in a frame and say, look, I went, I've got my degree. The, the, the benefit of educate, I mean, this is one of the reasons why K through 12 education is a public good and that's not controversial, right? Mm -hmm. No one says, how come, how come we, the taxpayers pay all that money towards K through 12? But when it comes to higher ed, then all of a sudden it's a, you know, it's a, it's something you purchase and something yeah. that you buy that you, only you benefit from. Uh, every, the whole community, the whole state benefits, mm. uh, the more people that are educated for that very reason, uh, uh, Jose. Awesome. Any other, anything else, guys? Any other questions? Um, I don't, I don't have any questions, more so commentary. Um, I'm actually glad that I'm in this podcast session because I didn't think that the census was that important <laughs> until I started listening to the information that you were giving. And also I think it's, um, I thought it was a really important fact because I have friends of mine that um, they're always like, oh, I want to apply for the census or I want to like answer some questions, but because of their immigration status, um, that's what usually like hinders them from doing so. Mm. But I think it's important that you address that. And maybe some way, I feel like students should spread awareness, I guess, that people even, you know, outside of the immigration status and all that can work on those questions and stuff. Also, um, uh, another question, I have a question. Um, do you have to answer every single question on the census or? Generally not. Uh, and in fact, they'll, in the instructions, it'll probably tell you. Uh, I filled mine out a couple of months ago, so I can't remember <laughs> what, what all the questions are. But, uh, you know, it, not filling it out won't, not filling out a certain section won't make the rest of the data, uh, you know, uh, go to waste. Yeah. So if, if you don't fill out a particular part, uh, they don't throw out all the re all the results from a survey just because one or two pieces are are missing. And and any of our uh, uh, academic uh, faculty that are doing research will say, no, 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 we don't throw out the data. You know, maybe we have missing data, but that's OK. You know, we can yeah. we can account for that. Wow. Lavette, thank you. Um, any any final words? You know, we're we're running um running up on on the end of our show. Um, any final questions for Bob here? Um, what's a what's a ballpark percentage of the amount of people in the valley that apply or fill out the census? 
Yeah, that's I've, a good question. Yeah, I've heard numbers. Uh, I don't want to discourage people. Um, I mean, I've heard in the neighborhood between 50 and 60 percent uh, actually respond to the sentence. Of course, we want it to be more. I mean, and as a political scientist, you know, I would uh, uh, put my I would sit in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, at at our uh, level of voter turnout <laughs> during presidential years, because it's about the same amount, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. uh, in 2016, we had between 50 and 55 percent of the people who were eligible to vote to turn out to vote. So, uh, you know, there's there's something about that number. <laughs> there's just a certain percentage of people that won't participate, whether it's in elections or census. Wow. I think maybe we need to come back. We need to have another session just on civic participation, Bob, <laughs> especially with an I, election looming. <laughs> please don't tease me unless you really mean it. I think Nick would be excited about it. We've been talking about that. So, so yeah, keep your, keep your, um, what is this? Keep your calendar clear. I'll, I'll let you know. We want, <laughs> we want to do something about that. Lovely, um, lovely. Any final thoughts, Bob, for our audience? Uh, again, I would just encourage you, if you have already completed the census, uh, don't avoid the subject uh, with, with people that you come into contact with. Ask them, hey, did you fill out that census? No, I don't want to do Really? Why are we worried about Well, they're going to share my information. You know, it's against the law to do that. I mean, you know, uh, as we were saying, you know, educating people about the process and making it a little less mysterious, mm -hmm. uh, making it a little less intimidating. Yeah. Uh, I think is is helpful, and to, to say, you know, it's not uh, <laughs> there's not some secret conspiracy where they're trying to, you know, do something bad to you uh, just yeah. by count counting, you know. Right. And I also Good. think, in regards to what you were saying about the amount of people actually participating, and it's you know, you know, below sixty, let's just say, ballpark, and. Last, last time we had the census, which was like the count, which was in April 2010, it said our population was 775,000. And then the estimate now from like 2019 that they were estimating for our population in this region for Hidalgo County was 868,000. Just for Hidalgo County. Just for Hidalgo County. And that is com that's a lot lower than the actual population that's here currently and a, a drastically lower so it's actually quite an effect on all our lives and all our resources and the things that help us so mm. i think for those final thoughts i think it is really important for people just to get involved because you know it's it, it's it's it means something when it's actually has a direct influence on our resources and who is representing us and how yeah so all right well, thank you. Thank you to everybody, Bob. Thank you for joining us. Lavette, thank you for joining us. I hope uh, to, to see you again on future podcasts. And to my co-hosts, uh, thank you as always. Uh, this concludes another episode of the FYE podcast. Before we go, just remember the last day for the census is September 30th. Please make sure you fill out your census if you have not. And if you have um, but you know people that have not filled out their census, please encourage them to fill it out, right? Inform them as best as you can. Uh, this concludes another episode of the podcast. We will see you next time. Goodbye.